Hey, peace and blessings to you. My name is Jerry B. I am the Entree Musician, and so are you. And so is this incredible gentleman we are going to be speaking with today. In fact, we have elevated him to the ultra Entree Musician. He is none other than Grammy Award winning producer, composer, arranger, and synthesis, Mr. Jason Miles. Now, Jason has worked with Miles Davis, Marcus Miller, Luther Vandross, Shaka Khan, Lisa Fisher, Michael Brecker, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, oh my God, Aretha, Roberta, George Benson, Sting, David Sanborn, and so many, many others. Jason has this absolutely outstanding book entitled The Extraordinary Journey of Jason Miles, a musical biography, which is an absolute must read. We are <laughs> dedicating this episode of our conversation to Bernard Wright, who recently passed away, totally influential keyboard player who uh, Jason has worked with. I'm sure we're going to share some memories of Bernard, but you have to stick in and check out the experience and the wonderful career of Brother Jason Miles. My friend, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. We're a little uh, stressed here. We just sold our house and we're getting ready. To, we're packing. Every, it's, it's very, it's, you can't believe what happens until you're really in the middle of it, you know, and it's really stressful. And, excuse me. <laughs> it's put like so much musical stuff aside because there's so much involved between between you know packing pack everything, selling the house, cleaning the house, throwing stuff away, doing doing this, and then and then pre preparing for the move, which is going to be overseas, and right. so and so nobody will be seeing me play anywhere, you know, in the United States probably for a long time because uh, you know it just it, could, it couldn't work out. It's impossible, you know, for me to you got to put a gig together, you got to put a band together, you got to put this together, you got to rehearse. There's not even ten minutes to think about that. I mean, if something really good happened, I would have managed to you know do that. But I, you know, it. I just never thought that this year that there would be anything. So we, we planned on not having anything happening this year except for the book and some online, you know, music releases and everything like 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 that. And um, you know, so that's what we're going through right now and everything. You know, so it's deep, but we're getting there. Well, I can understand the stress of it all. My wife is a realtor and uh, she works with uh, all kinds of red tape and whatnot. So I get it. I get the strain that you're under. I'm grateful that you've given us the time today. Not a problem. In the, the morning is, is good, you know, because it opens up the rest of the day. Absolutely. Know? Well, you've written, and, you know, and I mean this wholeheartedly, man, you've written an outstanding book. I can tell you that I went down memory lane. Most of the albums and the CDs that are on this book, uh, in this book, and that you talk about most of the artists, I have the CDs, I have the albums, and I read your book like a tremendously long uh Liner note, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean, no. I went through the albums and I went through the experiences, and you put us right in the room, man. I thank you well, for that's that. What the, that's what the, but before we even get started, people might be people just might want to see, and I didn't do this the last time, but here's the book right over here. Yeah, man. You know, that's the book, Extraordinary Journey of Jason Miles. Oh, blah, it's blah, blah. excellent. Oh, yeah. And you can get it on Am. You can get it on, you know, Amazon and, you know, uh, Look, here's the story. If you want to get really quality stuff out there in, in, in these days, you know, and this is up to the fans, you got to support the artist. You know, you can't keep on looking at something like that, you know, and going, you know, it's bad enough that we give away our music because we do give away our music. You know, nobody buys, you, you, you know, the percentage of people like all well, these people uh, come on and say, I'm number one, I'm number this, I'm number that. I say, you know what, man, congratulations, I, you know, congratulations, but... How many CDs did you actually sell? You know, how many streams are there? You know, because that's the tell of the tape. You know, anybody can see, not anybody, but you know, any, everybody can feel that gratification when you see a song going up the charts or it's up there and everything. But then the reality is, 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 is that it, at the end of the day, is it worth it? Is it worth what you, what, what you're going to bet? And one of the reasons why I, I, I wrote the book was because I think it's like another chapter that I could start to get into as far as like, um, you know, I have the experience, I have the stories, I have this and stuff that, that that's unique unto myself. So that's why I decided, you know, let, let's go with this. I was always wanted to write a book because I have some stories and I know how to tell stories. And uh, people, you know, because I believe that not everybody can write a book and tell the story. 
You know what I mean? And one of the things, you know, I had a great editor, you know, and you got to give them something to work with or else you might as well get a ghostwriter and like half the celebrities do and just sit there and tell them shit and they go and they turn it into a book. This is really from the heart and it really brings you into the experience. And, you know, look, all you got to do is read the forward by Marcus and see what he said. And uh, and that's the reality of it to you know, see what to see what's happening. I'm, you know, I'm just trying to go and tell my story, you know. I'm a guy that's been through extraordinary situations just to, uh, you know, to go in and make something happen with my life and career. And I was able to do that because, because, you know, I thought as an individual, not as like part of a, you know, everybody else doing the same thing. Man, well, it it was really, it, it's when you say extraordinary journey, the way that you even walked into being a synthesis, getting involved with uh, synthesizers and sounds uh, and programming at the beginning was fantastic. Can you tell us that story? Well, I think, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, is that there is luck involved. OK, and the luck involved had to do with when I was born, basically, you know, and to be born through the time that I was seeing so many different things. I was born at the time when the synthesizer thing was first starting to happen. You know, so, so it's like back in 1974, when I came back to New York, you know, I was already into knowing that this is what I wanted. wanted. And then being up close with some of the groups like Weather Report and seeing them and, and listening to like Chick Corea and other people like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and real synthesists like, like Tomita from Japan and Vangelis and uh, Giorgio Moroda and people that were really using them to create music that got me into knowing like the possibility. So I was fascinated by it because, you know, I love jazz. Okay. I, I, I love jazz, but I'm a hybrid musician. I'm a hybrid musician. I was born in New York and I saw all this kinds of music. I played in, I, I played in bands where I played rocks, rock songs, you know, and top 40 songs, you know? And then when I read Michael Brecker's biography, he did the same thing, you know. I mean, we were all in bands. We were all playing in different. I was playing Sweet Sixteen parties, the Catskill Mountains, you know. At the same time, I was listening to West Montgomery and Miles Davis, you know. But I, I couldn't go to a gig and play that, you know. So I went to the Fillmore East. I went to the Cafe Agogo. We played at the Bitter End, you know. We did all of this stuff, you know. And then, and then as I started getting, you know, older, I started appreciating what jazz was. And so I'm listening to that, and then all of a sudden, for real, like B Bitches Brew happened. And that and that really twisted my head around because you know hearing Chick on the Fender Road like they were doing it was such a predominant part. And I figured, wow, look at the keyboards on this man. This is what's happening. This is what's driving the whole thing. Exactly. Zavinal, Larry Young, Chick, you know, Herbie. They were they were driving it. And and gee, who were the guys that were really out there proponing all this electric jazz stuff? Those guys, Titans, Monsters, great jazz players, but also realized that they wouldn't want to be stuck in one place either. That's as right. much as, as like, and Zavinal would always say that to me, man. Joe Zavinal would always say that, you know, he, he did, you know, he's creating his music now. You know what I mean? That was, that was then a great appreciation, but you know, he doesn't want to be a part of, of that. And you know, when I came back, people were just telling me all the time, man, you're not going to make it, man. Cause you're not playing the changes. You're not playing in jazz. You're not doing the jazz vibe. I said, I, I am, I'm studying bebop with one of the best freaking guys there is on the planet. And I'm also studying classical music again. I'm back into that. And I'm, and I'm doing electronic music and I'm starting to write music again and getting into this whole thing. So, you know, it's just that I don't want to go and spend all my time doing what everybody else is doing. Right. And so, you know, when I came back to New York, I mean, the session scene here was like, man, the guys were monsters. I mean, you know, where was my spot? As a piano player, it was nowhere, you know, because I couldn't compete with like Richard T and Pat Rebelo and Herbie and Chick and guys like that that were still in the New York scene. You know, doing doing stuff, and I started realizing, you know, that like this is what you have to do. You have to find yourself as an individual and what it is that you're strong. And I always had a good ear. There's, there was no doubt about it. They always had a really good ear. And um, you know, getting into synthesizers and understanding about the sounds, and you know, that was a little good. And nobody took it seriously for real until like un until like polyphonic synthesizers started coming into play. Yeah. And that was like, you know, Heavy Weather was like an album that really like blew, blew, blew people away, that really created the whole thing. So did like Mysterious Traveler and everything. But 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 Zavinal's use of, of the synthesizers on Heavy Weather brought it to the next place, which brings us to the Prophet 5 synthesizer, yeah. which, which changed everything. Because that was the real first commercial polyphonic synth that was 
semi affordable, you know what I mean? But we all found the money to get it. And that changed the sound of that, that changed the sound of music. So basically I'm, I'm in my room, just, just tweaking away things and playing music and writing stuff and recording all this stuff, man. I've got like all of these like little snippets on tape. And then uh, Kenny Kirkland, a great keyboard player, piano player, who's a friend, you know, uh, he, uh, he, he said to me, look, look, uh, I got a date for this Japanese record date. And, um, you know, they want me to play synthesizers. I'm going, you're the man, Kenny. You could do that, man. He goes, no, no, man. Yeah, I could play it, but they're going to want some really great stuff, man. And that's not what I know how to do. Yeah. Right? So, so I was thinking, man, that maybe you can come to the studio with me. You know, I'll give you, you can get $500, you know, yeah. for, the, for, for, the, for the session. You bring your Profit 5 and then they have an Oberheim up there. And I said, oh, okay, let's do it, man. You know, so I went up there. And, you know, and Kenny, Kenny and I were there and we were just going over the tunes and he'd be playing like a little part. I'm going, okay, 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 I, I got this, you know, but, and I come up with something really cool. And then he'd start doing it and they'd go, whoa, man, you know, it's perfect. It fits into the track, song, blah, blah, blah. And so, yeah, so Kenny, you know, Kenny's going to go, man, I mean, you, you, you should be uh, thinking about some of this stuff. You know what I mean? I'm saying, you know, I never really did, but I guess that maybe I should, you know? And he goes, well, you know, while you're, while you're doing your other thing and everything like that, that's what you should be doing. This stuff, man, there's got to be people that, you know, uh, you know, want this on their records now, man, everybody. So what was happening was that every great producer back then yeah. needed a synth guy, mm. you know? So as we go into the years and the keyboards are more developing and I'm getting more keyboards now, you know, I'm getting more in debt and more keyboards, you know, and I'm making all this cool music and I'm starting to produce some artists, you know? I'm, you know, trying to you know, work on my way up through the scene. Still, it's, you know, a tough scene to break, but people are starting to know about me a little bit more, you know, and I got a couple of little breaks here playing in this really good New York band and everything. And basically, you know, the book uh, reflects a chapter because I'm not going to say the chapter. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but it's called January 24th, 1984, a night that I reconnected with Michael Brecker at a restaurant in New York. And, and that was huge. And it all worked its way into something where, you know, one night, I was at a club and, and Michael told Lenny White about me and Lenny White came over and he wanted to know like who my favorite, he asked me, who's your favorite producer? And was that a, we were having a great time and all these musicians were there and everything. And uh, Lenny asked me who my favorite producer was and I told him it was Trevor Horn. And he got really excited because he knew exactly what I was listening to. Yeah. Art of Noise, yeah. Art of Noise, Grace Jones, Slave to the Rhythm, or you know all that kind of stuff that was so cutting edge. And he was like, oh, my God, we got to do something, man, because he knew that I definitely knew what was going on. And so and so and so, you know, I, I had known Marcus for, for a number of years because, because Marcus played on my solo album in 1979 that I made. And uh, uh, it's, it's called it's called Cosmopolitan and it's online and everything. Like that. It's got it had Michael Brecker and, and Ricardo Silvera and Marcus. Everybody's super young. And it was really good. It came out great. And, but it's a long story about that one also. But anyway, what happened was that. Uh, you know, Lenny told Marcus that he should be calling me because, you know, Marcus was with Miles and this and that. And he doesn't know what's really going on with different people. And so Marcus gave me a shot and says, hey, man, you know, can you come to the studio today and everything? Like bring some keyboards. And I go, yeah. And that day in January in 1985, early January 1985, that was like 10 years with Marcus after that. You know, he, he started he started saying, you know, man, you know, this is what I need to be able to be something that's real. You know, you know, a legitimate production force. Because because you, because you've got to be known for bringing something. And I always said this, that there were guys that were great keyboard players that had synthesizers, you know, and I was a keyboard player that knew how to use synthesizers for real. I knew how to program them and give it everything. And so Marcus would say to me, you know, listen to that. Listen to that up there, man. I got these changes, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, listen, to, and, and, he, and it was such as messing around, playing voices and everything, you know, but it's got to blend with that and blend with this. And, and you know, we, we work together crafting this whole thing. And so, you know, it's like Marcus would say, you know, and it's in the forward, you know, I'd ask Jay about, you know, something like this. The next thing you know, man, I'm working all the changes around the sounds that he's given me because it's perfect, you know. And so that's kind of, you know, how this whole thing started developing. Then he introduced me to Luther. And of course, I met Miles, you know, and Tutu was, Tutu was exactly, I, I figured that it was our American version of Art of Noise in a way, you know, because, you know, you know, you know, because, no, you know, I'm sorry, and people could say that to this day, you know, nobody ever heard a jazz album like that before. Nobody, nobody. I mean, you know, there were guys, there were synthesizer stuff, and you even heard the early Miles albums, you know, where there was like, you know, keyboards and Oberheim synth and all this stuff and that basic sounds, but nobody took it to that next space where like people were going, oh my God, what's going on? Holy mackerel, man, you know? 
And there's a there's the a uh, there's a moment in Hannibal on that album that is very uh, well, well, you know it's penetrating in the way that you use the synthesizer around Miles' solo. I mean, it's just well, well, yeah, but that that's the next album. That's after two two. That's oh, that's a Mandla. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. But but it's crazy because we started a Mandla in 1987 in June of 1987, and we didn't finish it until January of 1989. You know. That Matutu went like whomp, right like that. We were in there every day, you know what I mean? But 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 a mandala was like in pieces. We'd be working on songs and different songs because Miles was real. Because after Tutu, Miles was like freaking on fire, man. You know, anyway, everybody wanted Miles back in Europe, you know. He'd been making a ton of money, man, you know. And I knew he was making a ton of money because he called me up. He called me up after a tour and wanted to know if he can come up to, my, to the house and look around because he wanted to buy a horse farm. Wow. So I said, Miles, man, you getting fat out there, man. You know what I mean? And 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 he would always say this, and he would always say this, man, that he really thanks Marcus and myself for help and Tommy for 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 getting him to this next place. We reinvented him again when nobody thought that nobody thought that he could get reinvented again, you know. But he knew what he wanted. Yeah. He just didn't know how to. He just didn't know the people that would get him there with what he was wanting to go on. And Marcus started figuring it out. And then when he, and then when we started working together, and he saw what was available to me and what I could do, yeah. Then it all started really coming together. And Luther also, you know, when we did uh, uh, "Give Me the Reason," that's the opposite end of Tutu. But what do you do with an R and B artist that wants to cross over to pop, but he doesn't want to lose his R and B audience? Certainly, he he wants to bring them over with him. Yeah. So you know, uh, so so you know, we had to create that, and that was a very cutting edge album. Yeah, for when it came out, because Luther Luther came out of there, man, like nobody else, not, no other R and B artist ever came out with. You know, that album was very detailed, very detailed. To give me the reason, you know. But Absolutely. I think any love, I think any love could be Luther's best album, and it was yeah. the one that sold the most. Now, now let me ask this because of the chron- chronological uh, sequence. Uh, didn't mm-hmm. any love come out prior to um, "Give Me the Reason"? No, or no, I haven't... no. Give me no. You have it backwards. Give me the reason. We started recording Give Me the Reason in June of 1986. I tell the story in the book. It, it's Mon- it's Montserrat. By the way, there's a, if, if anybody has Showtime, okay, Showtime, there is a movie on Showtime right now, On Demand and Everything. It's called Under the Volcano. And it's about air studios in Montserrat. Yeah. Very famous place. Very elite place. George Martin built the studio who produced the Beatles and everything. And it was on this little island, British island of Montserrat. And he created this world-class retreat. Mm. And uh, Luther was the Luther was Earth, Wind, and Fire went there, and Luther went there, and he had gone there for the album. The night I fell in love, he went there for that album, and then the next album he brought me. Marcus turned it up because that was the album that Luther just said to him, "Look, you know, we gave it a try with the night I fell in love." And don't get me wrong, that sold, and he was and he played every place he was going to play, but that wasn't good enough for him. He didn't want to play a Radio City Music Hall anymore. He wanted to play at Madison Square Garden. Yes. And in order to get that happening, he had to go monster pop, pop R&B. And it worked. It worked. We were there for 10 years with Luther. You know what I mean? I know it's in the book. I don't want a spoiler alert, but you can Mm -hmm. just uh, give us the 15 second version of how you almost got fired on that session. Oh, I got, I mean, we were in the uh, studio and uh, it was really, you know, a a tune to love and we were getting it together and the synthesizers just would not sync up with the tape. It was really, really, let me just fix my headphones. It was like really, really just not working. And uh, we figured it out finally what, what happened. And that was that we were using a different code for Marcus's drum machine that he was programming. And uh, well, let me just get this up here. Okay, there you go. And, um, and it wasn't syncing with my machine. But I mean, Luther got really impatient, man. And I said to him, look, man, I'm trying. This is what the story is, you know. You know, but we're gonna get it. But you know, I'm I'm trying. This is new. This is new technology, man. Right. You, you right. want the cut. You want the cutting edge. We're at the cutting edge, and you can ask the market. We get it to work, you know. And I don't know why this is happening, but also it was an electricity imbalance because Montserrat's electricity grid. There was a big soccer thing happening on the other side of the island, and that was draining a lot of the electricity away. And the studio didn't have its own generators and everything really for to run the studio. Mm. So that was kind of happening. And Luther got really impatient, man, but. When we got that, and uh, and I'm not going to say anything, but we got that, everything changed right after that. You know, everything totally changed after that. But well, I mean, you know, it was that, with Luther, I don't know whether it was ever smooth sailing as, as as far as like, you know, it was smooth sailing, but it was always an air of like, you know, 
we were, we always had to make something and figuring out if this was the thing that was going to go over the top or is this something that's sealed because you're working in a studio or something like that and everybody's great and we're having oh jason what's happening man yeah you want let's have some lunch let's chill but you know what there's a million dollars sitting on the record right now that's true know? yeah it's a million dollars they're spending on that you know anyway and 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 you're right how much do some of these albums cost most of the albums that we did were plus two hundred thousand mm. you know plus two hundred thousand and the money was there but still money was spent you know and, and and with somebody like Luther, everything depended on the record because it it fueled the tour. Yes, but then you you'd have to say that that's when the labels though were much different than things are being. Oh, right today. Uh, not even the place, not even worth even talking about. Right, you know, because the, because the labels were the ultimate. The, the labels and the music business were the ultimate trickle down trickle down uh, economics. Yes, because the because the money from the label went from like went went from like the label. To the artist okay now the artist got it management gets their advance they get their stuff the artist gets his advance then it goes what do we do make the record here's the record musicians over here that's this you know studio places that give you food in the studio tape you know so you want to buy a new synthesizer for that new uh, instruments you know, music stores everything is it's not, now all of a sudden you know you get down there what happens oh whoa you know we got to go and 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 mix it you know, more studio, more engineer, you know, all money's being floating around to all these different places from that top thing. Then what happens after that? Then the album comes out, and then what happens? Then the tour starts, and now you start back at the top again. Here's the tour, musicians, rehearsal studios, food, venues, backline, you know, uh, gee, right, 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 exactly, hotels, the audience, oh, gee, what's a great concert, what do you do? Let's go get something to eat. You know what I mean? But chilling after the concert, Madison Square Garden, all the places around are packed now. You know what I mean? That's what it was. Now there's shit. What do you got? You know, there ain't, there, there isn't no that. There isn't no that. There's this. Yeah. That's where it is. You're starting at the bottom now and going down. Yeah. You, you uh, mentioned uh, in one of the chapters where as you and your band was becoming more prominent, you uh, played at the Hollywood Bowl, 17,500, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. sold 12, did, did, I, did I have that figure right, 12 CDs, full sold yeah, out yeah. show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you must, have, you must have thought, okay, the industry is flat on its face right now. Yeah, but I, I wasn't even thinking that because I knew that already. I see. But you, you, know, you I mean, anticipated like, selling more than 12 CDs, so. I anticipated selling a, a box of 30. Yeah. A 30, still, that's uh, it? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, but you know what, though? But I went to the Long Beach Jazz Festival, which is which is something that's also an interesting thing. I went to the Long Beach Jazz Festival and played to Grover with Love there in 2010. And the album Grover Live that we had gotten all the uh, a concert from that we put out that was like a live concert of, of Grover. And that, and that took us months to find that concert, the right one to put out. And what happened was that, um, you know, that concert in 2010, I sold, I think I sold like about 85 CDs. There was a line and people were buying it and everything. Then I went out again with, Can I, I went out in 2008, uh, Candy Dulfer and I had a band together on the West Coast and, uh, and I brought albums out there and I sold a bunch of albums there. And it just seemed like right around when the real streaming stuff was happening, Spotify and all this stuff, the last few years, I think the whole thing is just cratered. And there really are in CD sales. I cannot see how people are selling. I mean, that people are going to sell CDs on on on, on you know uh, Bandcamp, but I think it's in the hundreds, not the thousands. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And I, I mean, you know, and, this, and and the streaming numbers are like you know, I, you know, he, how do you survive on that? You know, at, and, and at the same point, you know, you go and you say, well, you know, you do this, you can get yourself out there. But then the then then the whole business has consolidated now. Right. With age, with agents and promoters, and who's owning this and what's going on with that. I mean, when I'm looking at festivals right now, this year especially, you know what I see? I see the deck. I see the deck chairs being rearranged. Hey, wow. You know what I mean by I see like just the same artists being. You know, if you look at the smooth jazz shows, everybody's right. the same, same, same people, same. No, no difference. Everybody's the same. You know what I mean? And, and believe me, that's because, you know, they have the same agent. They have this. Right. And if you want somebody up there, you got to take this guy down there. And if you want this, so they end up going, okay, well, who do you got? And they just start, you know, you know booking everything. Unless you're like a really, you know, super artist, like somebody really big that they just will go to that place. But I find myself in the middle of that also because I've played, I've played to Grover with Love and Weather Report 
and some of my other shows at great venues all over the world, man, you know, and yet, and yet you'd think that like, okay, well, here's my track record and everything, but you know, well, you know, we're going to do that instead because we get them and them and them and them and them. So you find yourself for like, you know, being the person that like the one to step out to do something really original, Yeah. you know, you got, you find those, those few choice people that are going to go and, you know, uh, say, I love what Jason does. And, uh, you know, the, the door's always open and everything like that. And I, and you know, that happens. And the one thing that I can say is that every show we've done, and they're all on YouTube, a lot of them, you know, yeah, we blew, we blew the house down, but it's not about that. It's about politics and it's about, you know, all these other things, because it's obvious when you see, look at all the different festivals around, even jam band festivals, you know, they're all, you know, you know they, they go and they rotate the, you know, the, the big artists are up there. And then you look below and you have a whole list of people below that, like a 50 bands. Right. And you say, how are these guys getting paid? You know what I mean? You know, if they're not big, they're not this. I mean, you know, mu musicians and everything like that are, are really paying the price these days for trying to go and create excellence for themselves. And there's all the dynamics that just aren't making sense. You know, like, like when I can. Why don't what? you write a book about that? I mean, that you, you said a mouthful there and it all makes perfect sense. And I think. Well, I know it does. Someone you know, of your we're... caliber and the experiences that you've had, you know, maybe the manifesto for the new entree musician of the 22nd century, like, you know, 25 why, years. Man. Boom. I because you were a pioneer and a yeah. synthesis and a futurist. So you can see what could happen mm -hmm. and maybe uh, lay down the foundation for how I, 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 I would be. I would be definitely shot down and skewered by a whole bunch of people. You but know? you would be telling the truth. Well, the, what, the, what, 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 the, you know, what the truth, the, the truth a couple of times got me fired. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know what but, I mean? Well, so what do you think when you move overseas now and you're, 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 you know, you're moving over and then you have to, like you said, at the very beginning of our conversation, recreate uh, in, in a very large sense, but, but, Jason Miles and what I, Jason is going to do. I don't, but, 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 they, but they know over there already about me. My, my legacy is my legacy is very straight. You know, it's just a matter of introductions and everything like that. You know, they all want to, they, 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 they treat, you know, the, the people of they go to somebody of your caliber, man, and you're, you're moving over here. This is amazing. It's fantastic. I keep on hearing, you know. So, oh my so God, then it's going to be an advantage to you then. It, it will be a proper oh, yes. advantage to you. Absolutely. That's what, you know, that, that's not the reason, the whole reason why we're moving. If I said that it wasn't, but I would put that in like, I, I would put that in like 30%. 33% of why we're moving over there, okay? The other 33% is that we want to go after 48 years of doing this. I want to smell the roses a little bit, man. I want to smell the roses in a place where I'm going to be I'm going to be appreciated, you know, and Kathy appreciated and we can go and be real with people that are treating us real, you know? And not just like you're not just like here I find the United States, man, there's a lot of takers, not a lot of givers. Yeah, you know? And then we have and 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 then we have the other third of of like, you know, wanting to go and travel more. And that ties into the first third where, you know, doing nice mellow tours for a couple of weeks, not being on the road for six weeks. And that, that shit will kill you, you know? You know, and it will, because I've looked at musicians that I haven't seen in a number of years and going, damn, man, this freaking guy's aged. And it's being on the road. It's not, you know, the road has never done great things for, for, for many people. I'll just tell you, you know? You know, it's brought great music to the audience. And there is the vibe of being up there and knowing that you're expressing yourself to people that 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 are ready to, to feel something and they want to feel it with you, man. And that's a great thing. And then after that, you know, and everybody leaves, well, you're in the you're in the car or the van or whatever, driving back to the hotel. They are in the room by yourself. Got to get up 6 a.m. in the morning, flight, this, that, you know, I mean, it's it, it that's the it's a job. It's not a job playing. It's a job doing it. That's the job. And if you don't treat that job as seriously as the performance nothing's gonna it's not gonna happen it's gonna be worse so you gotta go so you gotta go and keep everything up on on, on a high level one okay one okay we're in paris okay and we're playing at, at the duke de lombards and we're, i think it's running a little tight getting to london you know and so what happened was that um so what happened was that i went and um you know said oh man what's happening well anyway our flight was delayed three hours in paris okay Three hours in Paris, and the night before, I was thinking about it, and I and I had the number that I was given by uh by uh, by my friend in uh, um in in London. He goes, "This is the car service that the bad mofo's use, man. You know, this this is the one 
that's like there. They're more expensive, but this is the shit. You know, I said, okay, okay, no Uber this, no Uber that. You know, you're like, let's go. You know, and I called up the place and I said, because the gig, getting to the gig is the most important thing, you know? And so we were late, man. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, I, I call up the company, you know, we have it covered. There's our man is out there. Everything is cool. They bring up, they, they, they pull up a, a nice Mercedes van that's got like a sprinter that's really got your great seats, great everything, man. The guy gets in there, checks us right to Ronnie Scott's, man. And uh, we walk in as the opening band is playing for us, as, as a warm-up back is playing. We walk in right then. Wow. Okay. And I'm saying to myself, you know, and the cats go and the cats are looking at me going, man, Jason, man, it's taking care of freaking business, man. You know what I mean? I'm going, yeah, hello. Uh, you know? And we played a set that night that was epic. It was so epic that the Financial Times of London wrote about it the next day. And they gave me a four-star review in it. You know, accolades upon accolades, accolades, you know, totally amazing. You know, they, 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 just beautiful things Mike Hobart said about it. And what happened? The spirit of the band was brought to a good place because of what I did. I spent the money to go and make sure that the cats knew that I'm serious about this. Man. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they knew it and, and, and they knew it anyway. But to step up to the next level. And then the next day I said, well, this is working so good. And we got to be in freaking, you know, uh, Dresden tonight. And I just told them you know have them come back at 5 30 and pick us up you know in the morning oh sure no problem come back at 5 30 and what did it cost me it cost me like it cost me like 300 pounds 350 pounds for both ways that's a lot of money for two rides you know but you know what man everything was like the the respect level from the cats is one thing and knowing in your own personal satisfaction that the lessons that you learn luther vandross taught me that shit. he said to me this he says just remember man when in doubt go rich and famous he said to me, you know what I mean? By, and, and by that, and by that, this is exactly what's happening. You know what I mean? By, you know, if you are going and, and you, and you see this place over there, man, and dinner was going to cost you like $30 at that place. And that place is unbelievable. It's going to cost you $50. Go to the freaking $50 place, man. You deserve it. You know what I mean? Well, you know, or, you're not going to pull on the side of the road and sleep with them. You're going to go to a hotel and sleep that night. You know what I mean? You, you know, that's it. And so when I was, and so when I was doing that, I was saying to myself, this is a Luther move for real. You know what I mean? But, and a lot of people don't understand that because, well, I'm taking money out of here. But if you're a leader, this is what leaders do. You know, they don't try to go and screw over the people in their band. They try to make it so the loyalty is there. And that's one thing that I don't think that anybody in the whole freaking music business can say is that, you know, is, is, is that they know that when they're working with me, that that this is a, a, a real dependable vibe and that you're going to be treated the way you should be treated. And I only ask that you give that back to me in your performance and your reliability. Absolutely. That's what, well, but that the whole thing is, that's what's doing this for this many years does. You learn. And, you know, yeah, I'd love to teach this, you know, but you know what? So many powers against me, man. They don't want me to teach this. They want kids, you know, kids are in school right now. And, you know, there's a lot of things that you learn in school that's really technical and that's really, really important. Okay. But I don't believe they teach you how to be a musician. That's, that's perfect. That's, you said that perfectly. They, you know, you know and, and everything about being a musician is not just your gift or your talent. There's that whole aura. That's what oh, I'm you kidding me? I was at I was at a, a, a piano player, Mike Melillo, in 1975. You know, I I started realizing my weaknesses. You know, coming back from school after four years, not being in a music program, coming back to New York, I needed to go and regain my mojo. You know, which I had for many years but kind of like was slipping, but not up here. It wasn't, it's just that, you know, the, you know, the skill set, what, you know, should have been higher. And I said, I got to go and do like a, a total injection of, you know, vitamin injection, man, you know, to get it. So I really put my, I, 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 I put everything that I had into it, you know what I mean? But, and so for a while there for like a solid year, as Kathy was scuffling and we were working and trying to do different things and picking up, you know, I was studying electronic music. I was getting back into arranging. I was getting, you know, cl my classical shit back together again and everything with the grand master. And I was studying with a guy that was a bebop master who played with Sonny Rollins and was playing with Phil Woods. And, and I played for him and he goes to me, you know, I could definitely help you with a lot of stuff. He goes, you know, what? but what I'm going to really help you be is I'm going to really show you what being a musician is. Wow. And that really stuck to me. And uh, you know, when I started realizing it, about like when you're at a club and you're you were hanging, you know what I mean? There's an art to the whole thing. And you can't learn that by yourself. You have to learn that from like the cats that were there that that showed you. Yeah. 
So I always, I always sat and paid attention. And that's what, that's what Marcus said in the book, that when everything was going on, I was sitting in the front row watching the whole thing, absorbing everything. And so when people said to me, you know, wow, how did you do that record? How did you got Sting? And look, how did you do that? You know what I'm saying? How did you do that? 15 freaking 16 years in the freaking studios watching the watching the greats work if i didn't go and uh learn this stuff and i didn't pay attention i'm the biggest freaking idiot in the world understood understood you said a couple things in the book uh that i really uh dug uh not necessarily that you wrote it down, but you implied it, you know, by your presence and every session that you were in, especially during that decade that you were with uh, Marcus, it seemed to me like you came in prepared, you knew what your responsibility was, and you stuck true to that. If there was a problem, you were going to troubleshoot it and solved it. But you had so prepared your gear that you just came and plugged in and said, hey, this is what's happening. I know I'm not the producer, but I'm here with all of my tools and whatever the producer wants. I'm ready for it. I love that. Well, like the whole thing is great producers needed a needed a very solid team with them, you know. And, you know, there was a group of us, a small group of us that work with some really great producers because they had the money to pay. I, I didn't do this, you know, in the, you know, in the beginning, you know, Marcus included, you know, I mean, we were just, you know, doing projects and he was getting paid that, and paid, but all of, you know, the stuff started elevating, man, as the word got out. And I know for a fact that, 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 uh, that a number of artists that Marcus was like working with and everything said to them, are you going to bring Jason Miles? You know, I, I knew that, you know, because I, I, I was there and I said, you know, that's the best compliment to me, man, you know, yeah. and I don't say anything because, you know, I respected where he was at. And I also knew that when you were at somebody like that level of the Tommy Lapumas and the Marcuses and the Luthers and everything like that, you know, yeah, I knew everybody, man. And we were all, we were all good friends. You know what I mean? But, but you have to understand about where their position is and everything and, and the demand on their time. Yeah. So you have to got to understand, like, I'm not attaching myself to the freaking foot to this guy. I'm not being dragged around. You know, when he when he needs me, I'm there. We can hang. We can have a great time. We can play video games. We can do this and everything. But it's over. Everybody needs their space. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. I understood how to give people the space and not be, you know, somebody was hanging on to the whole thing because I was trying to do my own vibe also in be in between but i also realized you know that like this journey i decided i was going to take over here and not be a producer and be then like i always said that you know like I, my old my whole line always was like that i was upper man i was low man on the totem pole of the upper echelon i love that you know? well it's the truth you know like i was treated just as good as everybody else but he also knew that when i was in the studio that i was there to do a job not their job it was not my album it was their album and it was Luther's album. And, you know, if you talk about being being prepared, you're going to the studio, man, to, at, at the top places, top places, Power Station, Right Track, Electric Lady, you know, uh, AM, The Village, you know, Westlake, those places, they ain't the cheapest places in the world, mm -hmm. you know? Nobody wants to sit there, man, and, you know, uh, nobody wants to sit there and, you know, watch you fool around with your shit and you don't know what you're doing. You know, and, and somebody like Marcus, you know, like I knew a certain thing. I knew when I knew when it was like, Jay, you know, re do the relaxed thing and take your time. This is not a big rush. You know, figure it out. And then, you know, let's let's go on it. You know, anybody. So, go, OK, you know, I was still working at my page and everything. But I also noticed that, well, there's nobody in the room breathing at me. I, I see what's going on. So I just want to make sure that everything is cool and everything will be. And then there were the times that I knew there was like, OK, man, th this cat, they want to move. So I got to be like at a laser point. You know what I mean? Laser point right there. And just knowing that you know, when we need this, we need this. There's no time for downtime over here, man. We got to move through this, you know? And so when you start understanding that and everything back then, you start to prepare yourself. How do I do this? How do we do this? And there's a reason why, you know, after a certain amount of time, man, working on a project, you come home and you don't get out of bed for a week, you know? Or, 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 or like when I got done with Power, when I, when I got done with the LA section of Power of Love, and uh, uh, you know my, the first section because there were there were, uh, there were two different trips to LA for that record. I mean, I came back and even we were on vacation. You know, went to Big Sur and everything that. And I still found myself telling my wife, I've "Got to go back to the room and I, I need a nap right over here." You know, because I was really tired because my brain was just it was like, you know, this is how intense it was. You know, and it was intense. There's no, it never seemed that way because we were always making things work. You know, you know what I mean. You know, we always make a thing about, oh, that sounds freaking great, right? Yeah, you know, we were just la laughing. Okay, let's go. Come on, hey, Mar Marcus, we'll come to, let's go play the baseball game. Let's go play this, you know, video game, 
for an hour basketball video you know what i mean everything and then you know we back it back at it you know what i mean so i mean you know but 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 a lot of money was being spent and if we were in la at a&m studios let's figure it man that's 18 that, that that's 1800 a day for the room plus tape plus plus marcus myself ray bardini nat adley jr at times okay uh so the three of us say they're staying at the either the either the sunset marquee or marcus had a beautiful house that luther rented him ray was staying there and salaries how much is that a day you know i would say i would say over ten thousand dollars a day almost you know anybody you're you're in there you know you know you're in there you're figuring what's going on yeah everybody's happy right now man that's dragging the shit down because the, the mood could change and, and it's up to you because it all started with me if my shit was moving the whole session was moving and and that was my job you know and it wasn't it was tough it was deep at times man but we made it and i made it through you know and and, and here we are you know yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about your beautiful wife, Kathy. She's been with you from the beginning, an excellent lyricist in her own mm -hmm. right. And oh, just yeah. how much you uh, and her just worked very well together. Uh, Miles Davis, the Marcus Miller, the Luther Vandross sessions and whatnot. Shaka Khan and her coming in and making sure that the lyrics were right on point. Let's just celebrate her for a few minutes. Well, I mean, you know, if you're celebrating me, you're celebrating her. I mean, you know, because we're we're the same. You know, we're we're equally tied at the at the hip. You know what I mean? You know, I, I don't make it happen. I mean, is it is it perfect? No. Am I perfect? I'm far from perfect. You know what I mean? And dealing with me sometimes, you know, artist moods, this, especially in you know, all the all, all stuff, man. You know, she's put up. She's put up. You know, the whole the whole thing is she knows she knows that through everything that we go through, that there's in, that there's real real love. It's not like it you know, just like this. We're not together because we need to be together. We're together because we want to be together and we want to spend as much time. And that's what we're doing this also because we want to spend as much time that we can in, in some place that we really enjoy together. Kathy just came out of nowhere writing lyrics. I just said, oh, these people are writing songs, man. You know, come on, man. We should be trying to do something. You're, you know, you you wrote my, my you wrote all my freaking term papers in college. You know what I mean? You know, let, listen, we, we started writing some songs together. And then all of a sudden we start clicking on a few talks for real. And we started recording them more. And the problem with us was that we were working with people that were on, on two upper tier of a level. And and when you have Marcus and Luther, there's a lot of money at stake with publishing. And so and so why should my songs go on the records when when they're the ones that are, you know, that are, that are generating and everything? So it took us a while, but now, you know, uh, you know, she's written all these songs, tons of songs we did together, you know. And finally, you know, she got some some kind of she got some recognition in there from uh different people that we were doing with that you know when, when she was writing for like yvonne lins and shaka stuff like that you know and, and especially on this project people that we did for the un she wrote she wrote half the songs there and the songs were spot on man everybody at that point was realizing everybody was like realizing kathy can do this because she wrote a tune called believing that's about uh, that's a that's a, a global song about religion you know and how do you go and put that in a song without pissing people off you know, and she and, and she did that. She wrote this song called Believing that was like just amazing, you know, and uh, and it's on the project. People, uh, it's, it's a soundtrack to the to the movie People and it's on YouTube and everything. people Bryson sings it, you know, it's, it's on, uh, you know, Spotify and all that stuff, you know, but but all of a sudden, you know, this was like 1993 and she had been writing stuff with me since 1984, like you know, but we kept on going and going and going now. And now all the songs that we have, I'm going to be putting out. That we recorded in the 80s i'm going to be taking those yes i have all these dats that we did as a very high level demos they were because because i had access to the best singers in new york the best singers always sang our demos for us and everything and they sound really great so now i'm starting a series called from the vault jason miles from the jason miles from the vault volume one 1980s and i'm going to do one for the, the first one is of this african singer named shudi mandalan who marcus introduced me to she was on jamaica boys i write about her in the book and we thought that Shooty was a star. We thought Shooty was a star. And so we signed it to our like production deal and everything, you know. And we uh, we did these great songs with her. And there were circumstances happened, and that she got pregnant, and she had to go back to Africa to raise the kid. And her father was a big deal in Mozambique that got assassinated, and the whole deal. She was gorgeous, and I, and and I put that away. And I said, all of a sudden, I said, I got these dats, and I took them over to a studio the other day, and I said, oh my god, 
we are putting this out. You know, so now I got I now I got six tunes all ready to go. This is going to be the first project we release. I got gorgeous pictures of her from back then also. So it's going to really reflect what the scene is and how it looked. And then I have like a techno pop album that I did. I I, I did I had done like some uh, some uh, some techno pop with some artists that really came out great, and that's been on the sidelines. And then I got all these like New York groove vocal tunes that were like were out. That's going to be out there. And then I have six masters from the last few years that I put on the side because I didn't like what the business was. And I'm going to be releasing all of this stuff now. And basically, Kathy's lyrics now will really be getting out there. Vanessa Williams, she wrote the two, she wrote the. Uh, theme song for the Divas Christmas Carol that was on VHS. That was one of their highest ones, it's called Heartquake. And if you look uh, if you look on YouTube on the Heartquake on Vanessa Williams, you'll see like the version that they do uh, that they do on the movie. And um, you know, you'll you know, you'll see what you'll, you'll see what the story is. It's it's like so, you know, happening. Vanessa heard it, she knew in a second that that was the song that she should be doing. And, you know, and, and we, we got on, you know, we got that going all of a sudden. It's like, whoa, because it was perfect. She, it was a perfect set of lyrics, you know. And uh, and so, you know, I have to respect where she, where she comes from. And I don't put too much pressure on her. She's not like a, a factory, you know. She's like a, somebody that puts the time into like it for real until she knows it's perfect. And now we have this Brazilian record that she's written lyrics for. And we have this other album that she has in there. You know, everything's, you know, right there. So we're going to be, you know, putting stuff out there now. And, uh you know, I felt that, uh, uh, you know, I would do anything for her. I mean, come on, you know, she, she sat with me through the best and the worst of times. She's seen the best stuff happen. She's seen the worst stuff happen, you know, and she hung in there. She hung in there. She saw us, she saw me go down to the depth of below and people would have maybe just bailed on you and she was there all the time. So what do you say? That's the thing that I tell musicians and I tell this to singers. I say, you know, watch out who you go with, man, you know, make sure that they know what the deal is because if they don't, you're going to get a divorce and that's what's going to happen that's what's going to happen you know you, you know you can't be somebody who, who's a, who, who's an engineer and, and who was working on records back then you know and had to be in the studio six days a week for 12 hours a day to make that serious money and then just go well he's not home and i want him to be you know and everything you know and, blah, 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 you know but you know you gotta you have to say what is this mission what are we here doing you know what i mean but it shouldn't take anything yes we got to find to spend some more time together and everything but we also have got to know that you're supporting me on this thing. And she did all the way down the line. I'd be gone for weeks, man. You know what I mean? Weeks. But she's that kind of person that could live in solitude a bit, you know. And then we had a dog that was, you know, she had a great dog that was her, her companion, you know, all that time. And I was home, you know, but there were times when I was gone. I mean, you know, but we also knew that this is what we're doing, man. We're making real money right now. And if we want to look ahead, you know, we got to deal with this right now. So that's what happened. Well, you know, now we, you know, now when, all, when everybody was like going and staying at the Four Seasons in Maui and getting into BMWs and everything, we were taking it like much easier as far as where we spent money. And we put money away or we invested money so we could do this right now, years later. And you don't even know if you're going to make it this many years. But here I am. I just, you know, a little over 70 and I'm still, uh, you know, you know, here. And I think that I'm still here making music that is important. Yes, you are. That's absolutely right. Now, you had mentioned uh, the Jamaica Boys uh, early on. I know that was yeah, some of your yeah. first projects with Marcus. Yeah, uh, yeah. As we said before, you know, this episode being dedicated to uh, Bernard Wright's memory. What is your most fondest memories of uh, of Bernard Wright, this young prodigy that just came and wiped well, everything up? You know, you know, you know, Bernard, I'm, I'm trying to think how I said it. I said it in a thing. I said it in a... Um, I said it in a post that I did when I when he died. I said, you know, about you know Bernard was on a different kind of journey, man. His life was not easy, you know, and that reflected in everything. He was a prodigy, but who was there to nurture him? Who was there to really go and and tell him about you know moving through life and whatever? You can't send a kid on the road at fourteen years old and you know, oh, you, you expect this, you know, to happen, you know? I mean, it happened with Miles and Joey D. Francesco. Joey was like fifteen or sixteen when he played with Miles, but there was a credo out there from Joey's parents. You know, he's got this, none of that, and none of this, you know what I mean? And he went through Europe and everything with him, and, you know, it, it worked, you know? You know, Bernard came from a much tougher background, man. And so the challenges that he was facing were deeper than a lot of other people's challenges, all through him being like a prodigy like that and everything like that. He was able to overcome a lot of things, you know, to get there and fight his way through things, you know, and, and fight there, even though that we knew that it had a serious effect on him. You know, 
but he had a great musical mind. And, um, you know, when he was in that element, then there was no stopping him, you know, but I, but, you know, but I, but I think that if he would have really, you know, had, you know, you know, had, had, had a little bit more, you know, familial background, you know, a, a place that he could hang his hat really, you know, and, and a family, you know, and a, a mother, his grandmother raised him, you know, and all that. And so, you know, if he would have, if, if he would have had that, I, I'm not saying that, 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 I don't know with the circumstances that, with the car accident and everything, you know, but I just, I just know that he might've had an easier navigation because all he had to do was, was put his hands down on the keyboard and he came up with something, you know, he ca he came up with something. So, I mean, you know, you have to look at this whole thing about just what, you know, the experience of life itself. It's like people say, well, the musician, I'm saying, being in music, it's like, this is what you breathe. You get up every day and you're breathing. I'm not breathing it as, I'm not breathing it as much. I'm breathing it a lot, but it used to be like 110% that was breathing it. Now, now we're, now we're still breathing it, but we're also looking at like the next phase of where it's at. And, and, and I learned from like Chick Corea and everything. Look at Chick, man. He was going till the end, but that was his life. He was consumed by it. You know what I mean? He was consumed, you know, and, 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 you know, and you have to just kind of see what is it going to be. And I always said this, you know, when hopefully my last days are here and everything like that, you know, and, and, and you can see it ahead of you, you know, hopefully it's a long time from now and I could, you know, look and look at life and look back. There's not a lot that I'm going to regret or feel sad about and know that this extraordinary trip brought me to a place, you know, and, and here it is. It's, it's, you know, you have to try to get out of life what you really want to get out of it. And you can't stop fighting for it. Because once you do that, once you, once you do that, where do you go? You know what I mean? You know, there are, there are people that aren't meant to go to that place. There are people that are meant to go and work at offices and do this. We need everybody to do their job. But I always find that if you do your job and if you're better than everybody else, that job is going to take you to another place. And not just and not just and not just taking that. And then there are people that are very happy just being in the same place. You have my paycheck. Here it is. Thank you very much. You know, and that's it. And that's the way it is, because we're all different. But if this is what you want to do, and if you want to be, you know, a musician or you want to be something that you have to realize, man, that this is going to be the arrow does not point up all the time. You know, with that being said, what, is there anyone that you think that, uh, you know, out of the roster of amazing musicians and artists you've worked for, uh, worked with and worked for, is there anyone that you thought, man, I didn't get a chance to work with him or her and I wish I would have? Or well, yeah, you, I mean, I, you obviously, you know, Paul McCartney, you know what I mean? Somebody like somebody like that, I would have, you know, I, w I would like to have been on a Steely Dan album, you know. Uh, you know, but, 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 you know, that was a whole other thing. I, I can't tell you that everybody that worked that's on Stilly Dan albums worked out, walked out happy. Well, you know? yeah, yeah. Their, their audition process, you know, they would walk through 30 bases. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> I remember Don Grolnick, I remember Don Grolnick told me that he spent a week on Babylon Sisters and that really, and that really he was getting ready to jump out of the window. He told me, you know what I mean? But he said, it just would not stop everything, every change, every this, you know, but you know, they dealt on a certain kind of perfection, but the bottom line is, is that I'm still listening to those albums and I'm still listening to the Beatles and I'm still listening to Rubber Soul. You know what I mean? I think the artists that I wanted to work with more were cats like Steve Cropper, you know, Booker T and the MGs and that kind of Memphis funk stuff and everything. You know, that's what I wanted to, you know, get into really also. Cause I was a, look at as much as I loved Weather Report was as much as I loved Knock on Wood and Sam on Dave and, you know, that whole vibe. You know, so I mean, like, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's never one thing. It's always a number thing. I wish I could have worked with Milton Nascimento, who was a you know, Brazilian, my favorite Brazilian artist, you know, that Clube da Esquina. I was very lucky. I heard the album Clube da Esquina in 19, uh, 1975. And people were just discovering it 20 years later. And I got to live through this whole thing, just listening to the amazing songs and following the progression of Brazilian music, which is also music that's very important to me. I love Brazilian music. It's amazing that uh, you didn't do more work with uh, GRP. It seems like GRP was coming up uh, during that time that you were with Marcus. I know he had yeah, done yeah. some session work with you. Yeah, GRP, GR, GRP uh, was a very kind of uh, homogenous label. It was very like, you know, uh, nobody, they, you know, how can I say it? They made excellent music, but they, they, they weren't cutting edge and taking chances like that. They were making music. That was that was coming more to the mainstream and that's good that's what i was doing also but i didn't see like the jazz that they were doing was the kind of stuff the jazz that i was doing was more like you know the, the miles and the, 
Sanborn, you know, albums that were really going for the cutting edge, going for like the thing. The GRP albums were like, we have a roster. This is our roster. He sells that amount. He sells that amount. They weren't doing anything, you know, that would break them out of the radio. They needed the radio. They needed that, you know. These weren't like artists. that They were all great artists and famous artists too, but they needed a certain way in to be able to get those records promoted. Well, they were under the umbrella of... Uh... Were they under the umbrella of MCA or something? Yeah, 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 M M MCA. And and when you're under the umbrella of something like that, you got to start the, you know, uh, delivering. It was like Tommy was, but you know, Tommy took those George Benson records to another place. He he, you know, the you know the artists that like were on GRP, great artists. You know, Lee Rich now with Lee Lee did great, but there were also artists there that that needed producers, and the producers there weren't like you know, um, you know like Arif Martin or Tommy or Russ Teitelman or Marcus or something like that. They were cats that made a, you know, made a homogenous kind of albums that had, that were great and had songs and all sounded really good. Larry, Larry, uh, you know, Rosen. Larry Rosen. Yeah. He was great and everything, you know, but, but that's what they were known for. When Tommy did, 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 did like Tutu, his butt was on the line. I mean, you know, you're not putting your butt on the line, making an album with Spyro Gyra. You know, you know, you know, at, you know, at, you know, you know, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. They're going to tour. They're going to have this. They're going to be, you know, you know, and they're going to do this. Maybe it's not going to be the best selling album, but they're going to sell albums. Maybe they're going to have a big hit on it. Maybe they're not. But going and signing miles to your label, taking them off of Columbia after 35 years or something like that, you know, and then making this kind of album that nobody even saw coming down the pike and everything like that. And then continuing that process and then making more albums with like Luther on that kind of level, a Sanborn like we did with Close Up and Up Front. Those albums were all really standalone albums. And that's what we were doing. You know, even uh, Shaka Khan, you know, The Woman I Am, that album we did, that album is awesome. And the stuff that we did with Marcus was there. So when you look at GRP, you know, I could make that kind of stuff and I could do that stuff. And yeah, it was, that was cool, you know, but, but that's not, you know, where my wheelhouse was as far as back then. You know, and so uh, that that that's what I could say. But then I knew everybody up there, you know, I mean, you know, so that's kind of where that was at. You know, I asked a couple of producers of, of your caliber who worked with uh, many different artists, if they could describe uh, in one word the artist that I bring up. It's interesting to me to know uh, what their thoughts are. So if you could describe Marcus Miller in one word, what would that that first word that comes to your mind be? I mean, Marcus is a genius. He is. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know whether these days on the albums it is, you know, that he's that that he's showing the same genius that he was showing back and when back when we were doing it, because he's not producing a lot of artists anymore. And I knew that he wasn't going to be doing that anymore. After like 1995, I knew that it wasn't going to be like it was with him producing. He wanted to get into movies and everything. He settled into a different thing. But the quality of his work is still high. The quality of his of his concepts are still are still right there. But when you see genius, when you see genius happening, you know that you're there with it. And, you know, you, you kind of see, and it doesn't change. It doesn't matter where he wants to take that. And he just wanted to take his genius to another place. You know, I, I mean, Luther Vandross was a, was a, a, you know, a vocal master. He was a vocal master. He knew how to do vocals better than anybody else in the history of music. I'm sorry, he did. He knew how to do those background vocals. He knew what the, the background vocals meant to it. He he kind of showed me in a way how much background vocals meant to a song, you know, and that everything. But see, because he was a background singer in the beginning, and you know, so so you know, so you see from him. And I would watch Luther produce. I, I watched Luther produce himself. You know, I sit in the back of you know, if we had a night office. I sometimes I'd stay in the studio and I'd watch him work it through. And that was how I understood how to produce vocals, you know. And I understood how, how every vocalist is different and how you got to produce him differently than him and him and him, or else you're going to get the same thing. What would your so, one word be for Michael Brecker? It's hard because, because you, you, you have to separate, you have to separate everything because he was so titanic on so many levels as a human being, he was the most giving and, 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 and person that just cared about humanity and your humanity. And as a musician, he strived for that level of excellence that he himself never thought that he could get to. And that everything that he did that was excellent never thought was good enough. And um, and I don't know whether there's one one word, but Michael befriended me in a way that very few people could ever do. You know, and at my lowest point, he was there for me. You know, and that's when you realize that like he's there because of you, not because of, you know, it's sometimes, you know, you see people, it's like just what just happened. 
I don't know if everybody knows this, and it's interesting we're talking about today. And um, but you know, this lady Megan Stabile, she died, who ran Revive the, the Revive Music Group. You should look up about her, Megan Stabile. She just died the other day. She committed suicide, and uh, she was 38 years old. And I watched it from the beginning grow into this thing, man, you know, and not the pressures that were governor her there. I just saw at the end of the day, there were people that were just takers and takers, you know, and she gave all that she gave, she gave, she gave, you know, but, but the whole thing is when you're, when you're giving and those people are taking, what are they appreciating from you? Are they really appreciating, you know? Well, I just did a gig, you know, with a, with a really great musician and everything. I'm not going to try to embarrass her, but it's a female. And it, and she and she was she was great and she she came up to me afterwards and she's a tough chick man trust me and she says to me you are a great person and you are a great band leader man thank you you know and I said hey man thank you no I'm not kidding around I'm serious you know I mean I know how we are but you you know and I said thank you man and I started realizing you know that like I gave it to them to succeed it's a great it's a leader that gives it to the people with you to the ability to succeed you know. And that's why, you know, I look at I look at various different things and I look at how it is in the country and wh what leaders are giving us a chance to succeed. It's up to me to go as a, as a leader to make sure that I see the bass player succeed and the drummer succeed, because that's only going to make the music that we do better. And so if I don't treat them the right way, you know, I expect to get that back from them. But you know what? So many times, man, so many times you don't get it back. You don't get it back. I've put I've put thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in many people's pockets over the years, you know, and I would say what I got back, what I got back was pennies on the dollar, you know, and everything. They might not even realize that, but that's what it was. Pennies on now, the dollars. Well, let me ask this question. And, you know, it, it's, it's more of a life question than it is musical, sure. of course. But with respect to that, I mean, I, I can attend to that uh, being a pastor and you invest, invest, invest in people and you do get pennies on the dollar sometimes. But uh, do you feel it's still worth it? Because from my perspective, it's still worth it. I'm not responsible for their response as long well, as I continue to give be, from a pure heart. It would be it, it would be worth the pain and everything like that if the business was able to us make to, for us to go and and know that the pain is is, co is 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 compensated and it used to be you know now it's not compensated you know but look where we're at with covid now and inflation and everything how much can musicians make on the road now how much can they actually make you know they, they, promoters they lost money for all these years even though a lot of them got pandemic money you know what i mean some of them really survived some of them didn't and everything you know musicians some of them didn't survive you know but the reality is is that you know um it, it you know to me at where i'm at right now it's worth it to continue and to create and then to continue this legacy so i can try to really bring it full circle you know and full circle is going to europe and having a lifestyle for me and kathy and to be able to go and just you know work on on ourselves and work on the music and bring what i know to people that maybe will appreciate it and audiences that will appreciate it because i saw you know the last tour i did over there the audiences loved it, man. They couldn't get enough. I sold I sold over a hundred CDs on the tour for twenty euros each, you know, and and I could have sold more, you know, but you know that's what I want. I, I want I want that, and you know, audiences over here they do, but they're not given they're not given the choice in music over here. It's like in it's it's like you know it's like George Carlin said, you can have an onion bagel and you can have a, a you know a this you can have chocolate ice cream you can have strawberry you can have banana. Black raspberry cookies and cream. You can have all this stuff, but you can only have two political parties. You know, you know, you know, you, you know, you know, you know. I'm, I'm trying to make it so I'm, I'm trying to give people like you know, you should be able to have the choice, and you should be able to be exposed to the choice of something. But I think in the music business right now, you know, you're not exposed to those choices, and you're not given access to those choices because they're not promoting it. There's all these little niches going on. You know, years ago it was like you know, uh, you know, now we have like you know, best R and B song with rap lyrics, best. Best rap song, that's old school. Best new school rap song. Best, you know, uh, best jazz. Best jazz, that's smooth jazz. Best contemporary smooth jazz. Best smooth jazz solo. Best straight ahead solo. But, you know, you know, the, you know, everything has just got fragmented, man, where it used to be like an essential place and you knew what was going on. Now it's like, you know, 50,000 bloggers, 50,000 this, you know, all these things. And, and, and there's no central kind of vibe. And all you have to do, man, as far as jazz goes, is see how many pages like a magazine like Jazz Times used to be. That magazine used to be like about 120 pages. Now it's like 30 pages or something like that. Mix, mix Magazine with the recording studios. Mix Magazine was like a freaking Bible. 
We used to sit there in the studio. There was it on the on the on, on the table in the studio, Mix Magazine. Oh, okay. Oh well, yeah, look at this. Oh, we all, all the time. Everybody was in the studio. We'd say, Hey, you got the new issue of Mix? Oh yeah, I, we got two of them, and it's in over there. You know, or Billboard. Billboard used to be the Luther would make me a Monday morning before I came to A and M. He'd make me go to freaking uh, Fairfax and uh, and Melrose to that to that place over there on Saturday. Uh, if we work on a Saturday, I stopped there Saturday to pick up Billboard for him because he wanted immediately. He would just sit in the studio on Billboard, Billboard, Bill. Oh yeah, oh look at this man. That meant something. Now Billboard means nothing. It's true. It's anyway, amazing. so anyway, I've spent now like a little over an hour here. Billy, my guts out. Yeah, you, you know? spilled your guts out. You came out. You came out swinging, man. I just have uh, two more questions for Go you ahead, because you didn't well, give well, me one word. Well, 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 I've got something to say because, because I do have to put a little promotion in here. Unless people have bailed on us by this. No, point. nobody's yeah. bailed. Nobody's bailed, uh, and they're going to keep coming, and it's going to be repeated listening and repeated okay, viewing okay. Okay, on great. this one because you have a lot to say. I have okay, okay. spread the word as much as I could uh, possibly do with respect okay, to yeah. our website okay, and with respect okay, to our yeah. social media okay, platforms. Yeah. Well, well, you I'll need to buy this there. book. Okay, I'm, thank you, thank you. Two more two more questions is, Go you gotta give me a one word on Miles Davis. Give me the one word description. That's impossible. That, that's what I would say, that's, that's the one word. Indescribable. Impossible. 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 Because you can't describe Miles. He was a different person to different people. People people would come up and they would hear all these terrible stories about Miles. And I'm sure some of them are believable and it's documented by some of them. But then you hear my stories about Miles and it's the exact opposite. You know what I mean? And, and, and I would always say, you know, I always say that if Kathy was stuck in New York and she couldn't get back home that day, I, and Miles would tell me, go, go over to call Miles, go over and stay with, you know, say it's to you. I, I, I bet you can stay there. And I know he would have let Kathy stay there and everything like that, you know, and she would have felt nothing. He wouldn't have because you know he's gonna mess with with uh, my stuff, you know. What I mean? And and musically, you know, musically, if you hung with him, man, and you really hung, and you saw what's going on, you got the nuggets, man. You got the you got the wisdom, you know. You got the wisdom, and you got what brought him here, and he brought you into his vibe. And I'm very lucky, man. Fortunate. That's what I always describe myself with Miles. Fortunate that 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 that, that I lined up, and for some reason, and I figured out why. Because in the beginning, he could not figure out how I did it. He couldn't figure it out. We'd be in the studio. I knew he was looking at me and he could still not figure out how he took this freaking thing and made it like this whole vibe, you know, where, where, where I met him one day in the studio when I was going to see Luther and he was next door with Michelle Legrand. And I didn't know that he was there. And so uh, Gordon, his right hand person said to me, uh, you know, hey, go and see Miles. He's in there with Michelle Legrand. I didn't know they were there. So I walked in and Miles was like, so great. He walked over to me, gave me a big hug. And then he said, Michelle. Man, this is Jason Miles, man. I, Marcus and I, we don't go anywhere without him, man. I'm telling you. And you know what? Next time we make a record, man, in the studio, just me, you, and Jason. We don't need anybody else, man. I'm just telling you. Michelle would be with him, like, who the fuck is this guy? You know what I mean? You know? And he was and he was cool. But I mean, like, you know, so when you were with Miles and he and he dug up, but then Miles also knew when, when it was when he knew when to tell you when it was time to go. You know? And like my friend Bob Berg played great with him, but he was amazing, Bob Berg with the Miles. And one night he brought another saxophone player on stage to play and Bob got really pissed, you know? And, and, and because, you know, Bob was a saxophone player and he brought this guy, he brought Gary Thomas on to play. Gary was like, great. Bob came off the stage and he was upset. And, um, and I said, you know what, man? Miles was just trying to tell Bob in a kind way, time to go, time to go, time to go on your own, go. You know what I mean? But he knew how to subtly do that because he wasn't going to fire Bob. You know, he's freaking amazing. You know what I mean? You know, so I mean, so that's kind of like, you know, about Miles. That's what I would say. You know, complex. That's the word that I would describe Miles. Complex. complex. Wow. Well, my final question would be, I mean, because you spent uh, so much of your career uh, creating great sounds through this synthesis technology. What is the state of synth programming? here in uh 2022 or is it dead it's not the same no 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 it, it's not dead it's just much more generic you know everybody's got the, kind of the same thing all the records kind of sound the same the people that haven't you know they, you know haven't made the same kind of commitment the people that i look at that are really into it are, 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 are older but younger cats are doing it but it's a more technical it's more technical and based on that more than an organic approach 
And my approach was very organic how I did it. And it was different synthesis because we had MIDI and MIDI was tying stuff together and creating textures and creating this. Now that doesn't exist anymore and it's all within the computer. So it's a different kind of vibe. So what happens is that anybody that buys stuff, they don't have to do anything with just 500 sounds that come with something. You know, anybody, and they could figure that out, but then I didn't want to program. They don't want to do this. They just want to get it and go, you know, what, do you, what is your me. approach then? What do you know, as you put your albums together, what is your approach to synthesis being that there's a thousand presets? What do, what do you do? Do you still, I just, start, I, just I, I, I just start with what I hear, you know, anybody, and I get to that point of, of, of what I hear music's going to change and you have to evolve with it. And you, you know, you, you have to evolve with, you have to bring what's from the past. And it's like Dan will let said, and I can, you know, what, I'll, I'll leave you with this, man. Dan Willett said this. He said, uh, um, you know, um, I should probably read this to end this. You know what I mean? Sure. I, I should read it. First of all, let me first say that, you know, my website, jasonmilesmusic.com. The book is on Amazon. You know, uh, if you contact me through the website, I still have some that I could might autograph. I still have some here because once we leave, I'm not going to be autographing books for the United States. I'm going to be in Europe, you know. And that's still a minute, but you know, but what I don't know, I'm going to order more more books in the United States. You know, we'll see. You know, but you know, it's Jason Miles Music. Then I'm on Facebook. I'm on YouTube. Go to there. Join my channels. You know, I mean, I I'll put into giving you what you give to me. You know, so if you support me, I'll support you. I'm always giving people extra music. I'm always giving people extra stuff. We're going to start a whole new program when I'm in Europe about a private little group. I'm going to have you know people that really want to be a part of it and everything. So this, so so so, uh, so there are so there are things that are that that are definitely happening, and I totally would love people to sign up to the website because that gets you my blogs and it gets you all the information that's going to be happening in the future and everything. But Dan Dan will let you know, uh, and, and my albums they're all on Spotify. My new album, Black Magic with the bonus tracks are there, and kind of new. Those are albums that reflect who I am, and they're not all the same. Sly Reimagine, Miles to Miles to Grover with Love. These are albums that that, that you're going through my musical journey with me. And it's not the same because my big beef with some people is that, you know, they've made the same albums for the last 20 years. You know, they're playing the same licks, same album, same this, same that. That's not me. I can't do that. I'm a restless musical soul, you know. But, but Dan, Dan, Dan Willett says in his autobiography, Jason Miles offers up close encounters with multiple creative powerhouses, including Miles Davis, Marcus Miller, Luther Vandross, Yvonne Lins, Grover Washington Jr., David Sanborn, Shaka Khan, Roberta Flack, and many others. His story also opens up a window on the long gone days of the costly ex excesses in the recording industry. He's frank about stressful costs of perfecting his craft, as well as his euphoria in coming up with just the right solution to what piece of music required. Jason has written a page turner that reflects on what he learned from his friendship with Miles Davis. Here it is. Keep one foot anchored in the past with the other firmly planted in the future. That's it. That's it. So you want to know what's happening? There it is. That's what's up. Well, I certainly appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your experience. Thank you for being an example to younger musicians like myself coming up through the ranks, man. I'm not an example for these these guys. That they look at me. No, nah, I don't care about this old. No, guy. Let, let let me say this. Let me say this. Look, my nose is brown enough. I don't have to say anything. I don't mean. You know, as I said, when I read the book, it was like I have the David Sanborn, Luther Vandross, Shaka Khan. I have all that stuff. I have to to. My heart was listening to that stuff while reading your book my and God. knowing. There's a brother who was there, who experienced it. The, the sensations that I feel right now, he helped make it happen. So to that's me, true. you are an example. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm giving that to you from my heart. Thank you. Now I must stay. That's what I can say. Well, All blessings right, to you. Take care of yourself. I will. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this has been an extraordinary conversation. Please buy the book, The Extraordinary Journey of Jason Miles. You've just heard it from him. You need to experience it from yourself. My name is Jerry B. I am the Entree Musician, and so are you. We will definitely see you next time. God bless. <laughs>